continuing on this Tuesday edition of the program. And uh, as I teased throughout the show in this hour, being joined uh, by the great Craig Kilborn, who does a terrific job, has a podcast, the Life Gorgeous podcast, formerly of ESPN, The Daily Show, The Late Late Show uh, on CBS. And he is Vikings fan number one, who as soon as I saw uh, the Vikings get a win on Sunday, the first person I caught, I was eating dim sum out in uh, in Roland Heights, not too far from you. And as soon as I saw the Vikings won, you were the first person that I thought of. How does that make you feel? Uh, I was flattered. I have a, I, my, as I like to tell my friends, my phone blew up. It was such a ridiculously exciting, bizarre seesaw game. And uh, hard to believe, hard to believe. There's some, there is some luck involved in some of these games, Jason. Yeah, of course there is. But I mean, what I'm curious is what your expectations were going into the game. I thought the Vikings were going to get waxed. I thought they were going to get exposed. I have not, I, I will be the first to it. Don't hang up on. I did not buy into this team. They, they, yeah. had, they, had, they had two losses, one loss. And it was basically the only good team they played. They beat three backup quarterbacks. I just wasn't sold. It's and, and point, you know, the yeah. whole non primetime Kirk Cousins thing, I just was not sold that they were going to be able to go into Buffalo and win this game. So I was as shocked as anybody. What were your expectations versus what you saw? So you did not offend me at all. I'm very <laughs> realistic about this team. Let me offer up some gems. First of all, I started following the team. I'm a little older than you. Uh, I started following the team. Right before Chuck Foreman's rookie year, which was 1972, Chuck Foreman was my favorite player growing up. Then I liked Anthony Carter. Uh, now I like Harrison, the hitman, Harry, Harrison Smith, and Eric Kendricks. I love Dalvin Cook. Uh, so this team has talent. Jefferson's one of the top receivers, top three receivers, top two, whatever you want to say. Dalvin is top three running back. We just got TJ Hawkinson tight end. We Zadarius Smith, we got from the Packers. He's playing well. Harrison Smith, Eric Kendricks, Patrick Peterson. We have talent. What frustrates me about this team, first of all, is the third straight year we've had a subpar defense. Zimmer was, I was a Zimmer fan. He's there, there's a whole story on Zim. He doesn't, he's not the same positive energy as, as Kevin O'Connell. But the last two years, Zim, the Vikings had a bad defense and Zim got fired. And uh, we still have a weird defense. Now, here's what here was a stat from a few weeks ago. First three quarters, they're down in the 20s ranked on defense. Fourth quarter, they're ranked high in the top 10 in defense. Uh, the Eagles waxed the Vikings. The Eagles did not score in the second half. Um, I I hold space or I stay positive where the defense can improve. It's a new scheme. It's a shell defense. We're going to leave the middle open. We're not going to give up the big play. So I'm hoping we improve defensively. And I think we kind of do the big problem with the Vikings. I'm giving Jason, am I giving you too much information? No, no. I, I, is... I, I know this stuff. I, I follow this team. It's your hour. Okay. So the, the problem with the Vikings, the last few years, the offensive line sucketh. It was a problem. Kirk Cousins is not the most mobile quarterback, although he's better now. He's somehow, I don't know if he's more relaxed or comfortable with, with KO, Kevin O'Connell, but he's moving a little better in the pocket. He's scrambling a little bit. He says, admittedly, he only weighs 200 pounds. He's slight of frame, but can make every pass there is. But normally he kind of crumbles in the pocket, sometimes he even gets a strip sack, et cetera. We're, we have talent. I, we're all waiting for the Vikings to put it all together. We almost lost at home to Detroit. We've been down. So our record is impressive, but it doesn't mean, you know, I'm realistic. And then let me tell you how realistic I am. And I texted you this the other day. Yes, you did. I, I say the Eagles are the best. I saw them lose last night. The Eagles are the best. I have a lot of respect for the 49ers because I like their defense. I like their head coach. And then we're going to find out this Sunday, Dallas is coming to town. They're going to play the Vikes. So those three teams might be better than the Vikings. But I always look at it as, you know, 
not a great year with a lot of teams. Maybe anybody can beat anybody on a given day. You said that you thought the Vikings might get waxed. Well, they almost did. I mean, they Buffalo was down there twice in the red zone, and and Josh Allen threw picks. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've talked to I've talked to Bills fans and they're despondent. And I said, the guy's got to chill out in the red zone. He's got to he's got to be more conservative or smarter in the red zone. And I have this theory, you know, how Tom Brady says that Aaron Rodgers is more talented than I am. Rodgers can make every pass. It's pretty exciting. I mean, I uh, he'll take a risk. I can fit this in this window. I can move. I can I can dance. I can throw on the move. And Brady's got to be. I got to get this ball out. I'm not super mobile. I got to think. I got to think. I got to think. I think Josh Allen thinks he can conquer the world, and he screwed up. But to answer your question, I was I was waiting to see how the Vikings played going in. This is what I said. I just don't want to get embarrassed i i want it to be competitive we were down 17 jason yeah they, they were talking with craig kilborn uh joins us on the show here in this hour the life gorgeous podcast is his podcast we'll talk about that a little later on i to me i don't think and, and you you're a little older than me but a little but i can't ever remember a year and i know people probably say this stuff all the time and it sounds hyperbolic i can't remember a time where it's been so wide open. Yeah. I mean, I was of the belief that it was the Bills, Kansas City, and everybody else, and whoever came out of the NFC would lose to the Bills or Chiefs in the in the Super Bowl. I don't feel that way anymore. Maybe KC still, but I don't feel that way anymore. I think if I think if Dallas or San, or San Francisco gets there with their they have Super Bowl caliber defenses, I think they're capable of of doing something special there. And now I guess I have to put the Vikings in that category. I had the Giants to win five and a half games this year. They've already won seven. I can't remember a year where, and you know, the parody word always gets used and, and some will say mediocrity. I don't know how to describe it, you know, but right. to me, it, it just seems more wide open than any year I could remember. There is no one team that's inevitable. Yeah, I don't... Um there's usually a dominant team or two. You're right. And I don't remember certain years. Like I'm going to ask you, I don't know. I'm an, I'm an NBA fanatic, but I mm -hmm. love the NFL the year that, or I guess they won twice the year that Eli Manning and the giants won. So where were they? They were, they just got hot at the right time. Correct. Yeah, they yeah. did. So that's kind of, um, I'm to be honest. Um, I didn't know the Packers would, would struggle this much. Now it looks like obviously the Vikes are going to win the division. So I'm, I mean, the goal is, and uh, the goal is to get the NFC championship game. I don't know if we will, it will not surprise me. I, I know that we're capable of losing to people and we're also capable of beating some people. We, every game has been close. So there's been frustration in Minneapolis, St. Paul with, we don't win convincingly. And uh, so I, I take the, uh, I'm, I'm pretty greedy. realistic about it. what's That's that. Greedy. It's just so greedy to me from, well, it's it's a, one for crying out loud. Here's what I will say about the Vikings. I'm going to say, I kind of said it. I'm going to say it now. I'm going to ask you. Yes. I don't know how good a team we are. Let's just say we're a good team. It, are the Eagles a great team? I don't know. I don't know who the great team is in the NFC, but I think we're a good team, but this is what I think. We've got some talent. I mean, what do you, what do you think? As a non-Viking fan, mm -hmm. Dalvin Cook and Justin Jefferson. What do you think of those two guys? They were thinking about they were talking about Justin Jefferson before the year started. It might have been Mike Florio or Chris Sims, one of these talking heads, um, who was saying they thought he could actually be an MVP candidate this year. Yeah. That's how special he of a receiver is. Justin Jefferson is. So without it goes without saying um how talented he is. You know, but but like you said, it's the defense that that obviously gives you cause for concern if you're if you're a Vikings fan. But before the season started, I mean, who would have thought that halfway through the year you'd be looking at a situation where Green Bay was this bad? I know they got the win over Dallas. Dallas, you know, figured out a way to screw up that game late. Um, and Rodgers has been a mess, uh, you know, with that receiving core, and he's grumpy and he's miserable about the lack of talent they that they've kind of put around him this year. And some of that's his own fault, but. Who would have thought, you know, now we're talking about Justin Fields is all of a sudden, I mean, a month ago, 
I, I was having a conversation on the show about the fact that Justin Fields, you know, it was time for them to move on. If they weren't going to put talent around them, then they go out, get him some help. You know, they go get a Chase Claypool, and all of a sudden, they've set him loose, and Justin Fields is starting to look like, you know, he could be the next Lamar Jackson Yeah. in terms of that dual threat because he actually is starting to throw the ball better. And the whole NFC North is is so hard to figure out right now. Yeah, Justin Fields, my neighbor's a Bears fan, and he yeah. said that. He goes after the game. He goes, he's Lamar Jackson, because we're trying to figure out how good he is. And um, it was kind of funny. Um, they were going to – there was rumors about moving on from Kirk, but mm-hmm. the old regime when Rick Spielman was there, they tried to trade up to get uh, uh, Justin Fields, the Vikings. That's That was the story after the draft. But they kind of lowballed the Bears, or excuse me, they lowballed the team. I can't remember who the team was uh, that had that draft pick. But um, and then the Bears snuck, got in there, and they were aggressive. It's kind of amazing where, because I, I we talk about this. I sometimes I'm, I'm on a, a show in uh, Minneapolis, Dan Barrero's show on KFan, and the Bears. You have to be aggressive drafting quarterbacks. And, and the bears did it with Mitch Trubisky and screwed up. They gave up a lot. They didn't take Patrick Mahomes. They moved up and then they screwed up. And now they did it again. They went, they, they attempted again with Justin Fields. And I don't think they screwed up this time, but the Vikings have got to, at some point, because Kirk is, I'm going to ask you what you think of Kirk. I'm pretty realistic about him, but at some point they're going to move on from him. You got to be aggressive in the draft and take a chance on some of these guys. I'm trying to think we took Kellen Mond, which didn't work out. We took a guy named Christian Ponder. Oh yeah, but but what do you think of Cousins as a uh, as an NFL fan? Are you like a lot of guys where you're not a believer, or what are your what are your not thoughts? a believer? Not a believer. Yeah. I've seen too many primetime duds. Right. You know, I've seen too many primetime duds, and you know, once or twice you can say it's an anomaly, but when you when you have it as many times as he has, now it's now it's a trend. Now it's something that's sort of ingrained. Now it's sort of built into the cake you know, baked into the cake with, with a guy like Kirk Cousins that, you know, he's going to struggle in prime time in big spots. I've seen it too many times. Uh, we'll continue the conversation. Craig Kilmore and our guest uh, in this hour of the cash in on sports map radio and the sports map radio app. Uh, Craig Kilborn joining us on the program in this hour. Really happy to talk with him, formerly of ESPN, The Daily Show, The Late Late Show on CBS, now the host of the, the Life Gorgeous podcast, which I got to talk to him about. Uh, coming up here in a few minutes. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on, on a few other things in the in, in the NFL. Start uh, one, uh, two guys that are at the, the tail end of their careers and how they're conducting themselves in this moment is fascinating to watch because they're both going through similar issues, but the way they handle it is, is just fascinating to me to watch. One is Tom Brady. I thought after the divorce, uh, when the news of the divorce came in, I said, if he doesn't make the playoffs this year, I think he plays next year. And <laughs> not only do I think he plays next year, I think he either winds up in Vegas or San Francisco. If neither of those teams obviously win a Super Bowl, obviously it's not going to happen for, for Vegas. Um, but it, it could it could still happen conceivably for the 49ers. I could see him being there next year because I watch him play and I still think physically he has the tools to play the game now unencumbered by by basically being, you know, single dad Tom, I think he still plays next year if this team doesn't make the playoffs. Am I nuts? You're not nuts. It wouldn't bother me because I don't really care about people going out on top. I know how competitive Michael Jordan and Tom Brady are. It doesn't, I don't think it tarnished Michael Jordan playing for the Wizards. He actually played well. Uh, I marvel that Tom Brady at his age is playing as well as he is in this the last few, the last few years. I mean, a lot of quarterbacks, you know, they drop off much earlier sure. at an earlier age. Um, and I saw some of the game over there and it was in Germany, correct. Um, mm-hmm. And um, he just, um, he's just, he just has a feel. I mean, it's an understatement, but he just, I don't think he's dropped off. And so it, it doesn't bother me as a competitor. You want to, he wants to extract every season he can out of his talent. And if he has a really bad, bad uh, last season, it to me makes sense because I would rather just empty the tank as opposed to saying, you know, if you would have gone to the Niners the next year, you might've won the Super Bowl. I mean, let's, let's find out. So I, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. But the way he, see, and I guess this is the second part of the question. 
you watch the way he's handled the adversity this year. And then you watch the way Aaron Rodgers has handled the adversity. And it's, well, I've won back-to-back MVPs. I don't give a bleep what, you know, Steve Young says about the way I played against Detroit and threw three interceptions and and looked craptastic. You know, to me, it's the way the two are handling very similar situations where really for the first time in their careers, they've endured significant prolonged struggles with their teams. And Rodgers, to me, is, is so much more unprofessional in terms of the way he goes about dealing with it than Brady. And for years, I wasn't really a Brady guy because he was part of that Patriot system, and I'm a Northeast guy, and, and the Patriots just drove me nuts for years. But now watching him and how he's enduring this, I mean, I, he's, this guy's going through a lot this year. And the way he's handled it versus the way Rodgers has handled it. So I haven't listened to all the interviews. I'm I'm listening to what you're saying. Yeah. I can guess that Aaron Rodgers is is more loquacious. He's going to do more analyzing. Oh, he's the smartest guy in the room. He's the exactly. smartest guy in the room, Cindy. Right. And and Tom Brady, all he cares about is winning. So uh Aaron Rodgers has won one Super Bowl. I am surprised as the MVP back to back, he lost two playoff games at home. It to me, it's like, come on, you got to win one of those games at home. So I think he has more explaining to do and wants to explain more. He's, I mean, Tom Tom Brady says Aaron Rodgers is more talented than me. I get it, but I think Tom Brady doesn't want to say too much. He just wants to win, and he doesn't overanalyze. And so, uh, yeah, maybe maybe it's uh, it's Aaron Rodgers compensating for just the one win, and he's going to show how smart he is by answering all these questions and explaining and deflecting and rationalizing. But I do world. say, I, I yeah. will say, I know he irritates people, Aaron Rodgers, Ugh. but when he's the way he moves and the way he throws on the move and flicks his wrist and he's mobile, I prefer watching him throw a football. I used to love watching Peyton Manning throw a football. I like watching Aaron Rodgers throw. I love his throwing motion. I just do. Um, Josh Allen, I don't watch that much. When he runs, it's kind of ridiculous. No one can bring him down. <laughs> You know, somebody's like got Patrick, Patrick Mahomes is very entertaining to watch. And then when Kirk launches it to JJ. <laughs> Look at the glean in your eye when you when you talk now, about Kirk is okay. Uh, Kirk is solid. I mean, he did <laughs> he won a big game. He won a big uh playoff game down in New Orleans a few years ago when he, he threw the uh, deep pass to Thielen and then he lo- threw it up uh to uh Kyle Rudolph for the game winner. Uh he won that big playoff game. I think it's more about uh, – let me just tell you. He, they they have a better offensive line now. He has improved. He Last year when we kept losing close games, it wasn't his fault. He kept putting us in positions to win. Kicker missed a field goal. Dalvin fumbled at a, a, in an away game. Uh, the, the defense screwed up. So he's, in, he's actually improving as a quarterback. He's more clutch. He didn't play – you know, he – did you see that second interception he threw on Sunday where he yes. turned to his left and threw it right? I guess he was, he lost, you know, he didn't know who that was, but <laughs> he didn't, he didn't have the greatest game, but he made enough plays uh, to win. So he does throw a very pretty football. I, the whole prime time stuff, I don't really care about because I don't, I think the teams we were playing were always better, but um, uh I'm not, uh, nothing surprises me with him. He's playing better. He's solid. He's better than Trent Dilfer who won the Super Bowl. Uh, so I don't know, but I, I can see why people, yeah, I've talked a lot of outside people outside of Minnesota. They don't like him. I get it. Fine. Yeah. I mean, well, look, the, the whole thing with the vaccination stuff, I think rubbed people the wrong way last year. And, right. you know, a bunch of athletes have had to, to sort of deal with that thing. Talking with Craig Kilborn joins us here on the show. Um, the, the whole media though, you know, it's, it's changed so much in terms of, you know, back at when you were at, at ESPN and sports center, you know, the whole the whole way in which we go about talking to athletes, interviewing athletes, them wanting to control their own narrative now. You know, for instance, a guy like Rogers will only talk to Pat McAfee. You know, it's his right. soft little landing spot every week. Pat can talk to to um, Aaron Rodgers could talk to Pat McAfee and he's not going to get asked any really hard questions. Right. Follow ups and it's sort of that spot from the perspective of somebody who was, you know, 30 years ago in the in sort of the sports center realm to where we are, to where we are now and how it's changed. Do you like it? Is it for the better? Oh gosh. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, 
in in general it's a kind of a crazy world i'm probably taking this somewhere else where i'm not on twitter and i don't have any desire to be there are some clever people some of my writer friends are on twitter but we've also given voices to all the malcontents and whiners and angry bitter people um as far as sports media i guess i would say what i like is this may this may not um uh, this may not answer your question or you might not like the answer i like that aaron rodgers gets to control what he wants to say. So I like that he, if he's only going to do Pat McAfee because the media bothers him, uh, then I kind of get a kick out of that, that he's controlling it. So you might not like that. Cause if he doesn't want, like I, if he's rude in the press conference uh, to the, to the uh, reporters the you know, he's being terse and he's not answering or he is answering, but he's being combative. You know, he gets to control it with his friend, Pat McAfee. You think you don't think that these guys, you know, these guys, these these professional athletes should have to go into, you know, other settings. You think it's cool that they they could just say ah, whatever. Well, I think I'm saying it because I I, you know, when I worked in late night, sure, there's uh, so, some of the reporters are provocateurs and they're poking and they're bitter and they're blah blah blah, but they have um, an agenda. Yeah, yeah they yeah, and uh, they want to get that sound bite. They, they want to. I mean, I don't. I think Aaron Rodgers is nicer to the media than Bill Belichick. Do you have an issue with Bill Belichick? Oh God, Belichick <laughs> drive me nuts. And then the funny part is, when his career's done, Belichick will find his way into the media somehow, and and they'll all love him. They, Craig Kilborn, yeah, yeah, they do Craig. say they do say he's a uh, Belichick is a fun guy to hang yeah. out with. Like he has a personality, but he doesn't show that necessarily to the press. I got a funny Bill Belichick story I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, talking with Craig Kilborn joining us here in the hour uh, on the Cash In Sports Map Radio on the Sports Map Radio app. Quick break. We'll come back. Uh, more to do with Craig. Stay with us. Continuing on this Tuesday with Craig Kilborn, our guest for the hour here on the Cash In Sports Map Radio uh, in the Sports Map Radio app, and uh, this is this is so wild for me because um, people always ask me go to the dog park or I'm at bowling or something, and people always come up to me and they'll say, you know, what's the what do you get a kick out of the most doing what you do? You know, who's the coolest person you've ever talked to? Oh, have you ever met Derek Jeter? And it's like, yeah, you know, I've been in the locker room with Derek Jeter. I've talked to him and stuff like that. But when people always ask me what I get the biggest kick out of, I get a kick out of the people that I watched when I was young and at that age where I said, I want to work in this industry. So a guy like you, a guy like Dan Patrick, Keith Olbermann, the whole Sports Center gang from, from that generation – People I grew up watching, you know, inter I interviewed Macho Man Randy Savage once. It's, God, it's got to be almost 17, 18 years ago when first Spider-Man came out. And people are like, really? That's the interview you got a biggest kick up? Yes, because I watched WWF growing up. That's the stuff that that I got into. So it's not necessarily interviewing the athletes that I loved growing up, but interviewing the people that I, I got to watch growing up that made me want to do this for a living. And even at 45 and 25 years into this business, I still get a kick out of talking to people um, like our guest, Craig Kilborn, who's, who's joined us on the show today. Do you still have those moments? Have you had, you know, what was the moment for you that you, you talked to somebody that maybe you grew up because you're a little, little older than me, as we've referred to in this interview. <laughs> Who's the who's the person that maybe you talked to that was kind of that moment where you were like, man, I can't believe I'm talking to this person that I grew up watching that that maybe I want that made me want to do this. Well, not necessarily made me want to do this. I mean, I was a Johnny Carson fan. Sure. And uh, but there are a few guests that meant a lot to me that I got to interview. Bill Murray was the funniest man to a lot of us growing up. I interviewed him like three times. He did my first show on CBS. He did the daily show a couple of times. So that was, that was uh, exciting for me. I got to interview Clint Eastwood and that was on the CBS late, late show because wow. I, I used to work in Salinas, Santa Cruz, Monterey, the 110 market, but I lived in Carmel and a friend of mine was named Dina Ruiz. She was a news anchor. I was a sportscaster and uh, we were at different net, uh, stations, but we were friends and she married Clint and she made Clint. She said, you got to do Craig's show on CBS. So that was, uh, that was exciting. And my, my dad uh, was a Willie Mays fan. 
And he, my dad told me Willie Mays was underrated. He's the greatest all around baseball player of all time. And I got to interview Willie Mays and that was pretty special. He, he was great. He, you know, he, first I, he knew I was excited and I, and I, I'm talking to him at, you know, I'm interviewing him and he goes, slow down, man. We got the whole hour. We, we didn't have the whole hour. We had an <laughs> actress and a comedian later. <laughs> slow down, man. We got the whole hour. And I asked, I asked him about the basket catch. And, you know, he says, well, he goes, when I was playing for the, uh, the Giants in New York, you also had the Brooklyn Dodgers and you had, uh, where well, there were three teams. What were the three teams? The Yankees, the Giants, and the Dodgers in New York. And you had Mickey Mantle, Duke Snyder, and Willie Mays. And he says, they're all, they're paying $3 a ticket, man. I got to put on a show. I'm competing with Duke and, and Mickey Mantle. I got to do the basket catch. I got to put on a show, man. He was so good. That's I funny. love him. I, I thought him. that reminds me of Ricky Henderson uh, when you tell that story. Cause I was, gosh, 2005 or 2006, I was doing play by play for the Atlantic League, independent baseball. And Ricky Henderson's playing for the team. And Bill Matlock is the manager. So it's about a half hour till first pitch on home opener in Newark, New Jersey, sold out crowd. And it's 30 minutes before the game. Ricky's not there yet. Ricky's not at the stadium. Ricky comes running out onto the field. And Matlock leans over to us and goes, I'm not starting him. Got here 30 minutes. It's Ricky Henderson. Matlock, Mad, Mad Dog's like, no, I'm not, I'm not starting him. And Ricky comes over, and I'm standing right next to Matlock. And Ricky Henderson comes over. And you know Ricky, if you know anything about Ricky. You know, Ricky's got to play today. Ricky's family's here today. Everything third person. Ricky got to exactly. Ricky got to be on the field today. Ricky got to put on a show. So when you just said that that Willie Mays anecdote, it kind of it kind of reminded me of that. Um, the Bill Belichick story I referred to before the break. I was at a I was at the Travelers Championship in uh, just outside Hartford, Connecticut, in Cromwell, TPC River Highlands. I was hosting a week of shows there for an ESPN radio affiliate I was working for. About 12 years ago, 13 years ago, celebrity pro-am day, Bill Belichick's out on the range. I'm like, this is it. I'm going to get Bill Belichick today. I'm such an idiot. I run out to the driving range. He's hitting balls. He's walking off the range. I, I He comes under the rope. I go up to him. Bill, Jason Page, uh, ESPN Radio in Hartford. We carry, you know, Patriots games on our, we're a Patriots affiliate. Uh, love to talk to you for a few minutes. He stops, looks at me and he goes, uh no, I just kept walking. That was that, that was my one time that I had a chance to get close to Bill Belichick. I talked oh. to everybody that day. Joe Pesci was there. All these people. Man. Bill Belichick. Uh no, that was and that was that was as That's close as I got. Funny. Is there That's... is there is there somebody <laughs> is there somebody that even at this stage of your, of your career, this you know this different stage, this new phase of your of your career where you're doing the podcast. Is there somebody that's like a must that you want to get that you haven't gotten yet? Somebody you'd love to talk to? There's got to be uh, somebody that you would just kill to talk to. That's a good question because I'm not really approaching it. And I did so many interviews and I had so many people uh, that I talked to, so many great guests, and I'm approaching the podcast. I have a YouTube channel and I, it's some, a lot of the podcasts are on the YouTube channel. And then of course they're on the, uh, the Apple and Spotify and iHeart, but I'm approaching it more as the life gorgeous. It's an, it's a extension of my Instagram, which is popular and it's, and it's kind of irreverent and it's about martinis and living the good life and eating cheese and going to French restaurants. So I've had some of my friends on and I wanted to, I think my problem was, I, I wanted to not have the pressure of booking people. You know, I wanted just to have my friends on and talk about life and my magical life and do talk about comedy. And we do the top five movies of all time. Now I did want a guy on and I had him on, but this is personal. I had the head coach of the Timberwolves on Chris Finch. I saw so that. I, yeah. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. So let me just think. So are you uh, just saying you're at this stage, you're just more interested and I'm not saying this in a bad way, but you're more interested in doing sort of self-serving stuff. Yeah, well, not I wouldn't use that term. But you, but, but you know what I mean. Things I, that I would say satis, satisfying. What would satisfying to me more personal? Um, I yeah, I wouldn't. It's my, it's my own thing. I wouldn't use the word self serving, but I I would use the term. I'm doing it uh, now. I do. I definitely do jokes about being self absorbed. I do jokes about that. It's my way of being. It's a unique way of being self deprecating. 
we can't control the way we look. Letterman called me a pretty boy. Well, I can't control my angelic <laughs> face. So I make fun of it saying, look at my beautiful skin. But I, I've told people, I said, I, based on my sarcasm, I, I should look like Tommy Lee Jones or somebody, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't look this way like a choir boy. But um, I'm trying to think of the guests because I really don't think about guests that much anymore. So I really, I'm not in that headspace um, of, of what, you know, what, what guest I would like. I know when I did the show, people would ask me that. The only guy I really wanted to interview, and he sadly has passed away, I was a big David Bowie fan. Uh. I, never, I never got to interview him. Um, I never interviewed Prince. I'm from Minneapolis, but I didn't really have that desire because he was so, you know, private and didn't do a lot of stuff. But I, I'm, I guess I'm one of those guys, and I, this is probably why I'm not, I'm not super ambitious or aggressive, where I don't think about that booking guests. They book guests for me, my booker, when I was at CBS. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to get the, uh, you know, the big elusive guest. That's probably why I'm, I'm a little different than other people. It's so funny because. <sighs> You talk about not being ambitious or, or things like that, but you're creative. And I'm trying to figure out how one can be creative yet not ambitious. Well, I would say I'm not. That's a good point. I, and the creativity is the key because it's an outlet for me. The Instagram to me is more creative than the podcast because I can just show a picture of myself and write something. My I have extra tight pores today or something really weird or irreverent. <laughs> and that's my creativity. And when I played basketball, I like pistol Pete Maravich and Dr. J and I like going behind my back and making no look passes and all this kind of stuff. Larry legend, you know, the way he passed the ball, but um, there is, when I say ambitious with the podcast, I'm just having fun right now. I'm having fun. I'm not trying to conquer the world. Now there, you know, I'll probably write a book one day and that, will be a lot of work my friends have told me it'll be a lot of work i feel like i have an obligation to, to tell some stories to the old fans about late night some of the positive some of the silliness and the dysfunction but i mean i i think i'm ambitious with certain things but the the, the projects that i want to do are so such a long shot so i just kind of like yeah you know, jason i waited a while um to do a podcast i mean everyone i was going to be the last man in America you were with the podcast you so. were but I, I do like giving back and I do like, the, I, I know that this doesn't sound like much, but the Instagram is satisfying because I can now narrow in. I, I, I may look like when I did late night that I would have really broad appeal, but my actual comedic sensibility, which is aristocratic, I'm a bit of an Anglophile, I'm English on both sides. I think it's somewhat narrow and, uh, and, and, and different. And I enjoy that. The one thing I can relate to you on is I got let go from NBC Sports. I was doing a nationally syndicated overnight show um, with NBC Sports Radio, and I was working out of New York, and I thought the rest of my life was finally, like, it was here. It was all ahead of me. And the experience I went through there was so bad towards the end that when I got let go, there were a couple other opportunities that popped up, and I didn't, I didn't take advantage of them. And in 2016, after starting in radio when I was, junior in high school. So 94, I finally said, you know what? I'm just done. And up until September, I, I stayed basically stayed off the radio for six years, TV and radio, pretty much. I was doing some talking head stuff for MSNBC and I was doing, doing some stuff for, for them on the side. And I just took six years. I traveled, did, did nothing. Right. And then I finally got the itch to kind of get back into it again. So I could kind of relate to the aspect of, you know, just staying away. Like, I mean, after you left the, the late, late show, it was at, at all, I would always say, where's Craig Kilborn? And every once in a while, you know, you Wikipedia or something, where are they? I'm just, they're still not doing anything. Right. And I look at where you are now and it's fascinating to me to, to sort of watch what is the next chapter? Is it just doing these sorts of passion projects? Is it, you, you talk about these long shot things you, you want to do. Is, is that what it is? Is that what you want the next 20 years to look like? Well, good question. 
Do you wake oh. up? I mean, do you wake up like me? I wake up some days and I'm like, yeah, I live in Palm Springs right now. Some days I wake up and I'm like, hey, you know what? My husband and I was like, you know what, honey, what do you think about the idea of us just moving to the Bay Area? Let's move to Seattle. We can go anywhere we want. He's got a he's got a fully remote position. I can right. do this. I could do this stuff from virtually anywhere. Right. I mean, is that is that how it is for you? Do you wake up some days and sort of feel, hey, you know what? Let's do this or let's let's do that. Uh, so this is what it is. I, I say to people, there's really not a lot I want to do. I accomplished my career goals. It wasn't always cracked up to be once they called me the natural host. I had accomplished my, my I say I've accomplished what I was trying to say. What I, the long shot would be something scripted, a character that I could play with in a, in a television show, in an independent film. Those are long shots. So, you know, what I think about doing is, I can do a podcast, which is relatively fun, or I can sure. write a book and I'm just going to enjoy life. Um, but I, I don't miss, for example, people will ask, do you miss late night? Not at all. I found it boring. I find the interviews boring. I'm not stimulated by this. I didn't like the comedy. And, and it's basically, this is what bothers me. Filling an hour. I got to fill an hour as opposed to this is really good. What we're doing. This is brilliant. What we're doing. Right. And, and, uh, some of the comedy was disposable. They didn't really do the YouTube stuff when we were, when we were doing the late night show, we had some great comedy. We did well, we did very well in the ratings. We were very fortunate to beat Kimmel in the ratings with half the, half the uh, writers and half the budget. But, um, you know, it, it's just, I don't, I don't miss that at all. So there are things I want to do, but they're kind of, I would just say they're long shots. So I just enjoy life. And I do think creatively if i write this book i might write multiple books it might be an outlet because when i was growing up i used to read sports illustrated from cover you know front cover to back cover and there was this guy named alistair cook from uh, england and he had a show over here this was like in the 70s and he said I heard the best writers in America write for Sports Illustrated because you had Curry Kirkpatrick and Frank DeFord. And I think Hal, David Halberstam wrote for sure. Sports Illustrated. I think Jim Murray wrote some for Sports Illustrated. And they would turn a phrase. Uh, you know, Jim Murray would say, you know, uh, tri uh, Willie Mays' glove is where triples go to die. Very poetic. Yeah, yeah. And I enjoy writing and turning a phrase. And I was influenced by the writers in Sports Illustrated. So I could get I could get some uh, satisfaction uh, out of uh, writing books, or I, and I have to start with one. But um, um, so I yeah I'm not particularly ambitious uh, in certain areas. I'm kind of just enjoying life. But thank God I do have a little bit of an outlet, and uh, I'm enjoying that. Um, I was thinking about this as I was in the shower of all places before I uh, rushed to interview you today. Um, there's a president's club with all the former presidents. Is there anything like that for the daily show? Like, do you talk to John Stewart or, or Trevor Noah and, or, or anything like that? No, I had dinner a few years ago with Jimmy Kimmel, but I don't, uh, I don't stay in touch with a lot of people. I have kind of a small circle of friends. Is that by choice? Like, what's that? Is yeah. That by choice. Yeah. I, I'm going to say it's by choice. It's also no interest. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have, uh, a couple writer friends from the CBS Late Late Show, Alex Salkin Goldie, who's Julia Sharp, and Mike Gibbons, Gibby. Uh, they're my friends. They're very funny. They're very clever. And I have a great older brother. And then I have a wife and uh, a couple other friends. I actually had uh, this week, I think, where I just recorded yesterday, my friend Hank Perlman and Caleb Dewart, who work for Hungry Man, which is a commercial production company. So Hank's a director and they direct a lot of Super Bowl commercials. He also came up with the This Is Sports Center campaign huh. in the 90s where all the athletes were up there at uh, Bristol. But uh, no, I have my friends that I'm not, uh, I kind of moved on from late night. It was cathartic. It was one of the happiest days of my life when I left. It was also a happy day when I got the job at CBS. I did it for five years, but it was exhilarating leaving and not everyone understands that but some people do the so same thing with the late late show you never talk to any of those guys like the it's funny to me that people that have hosted because it's such a small fraternity you know and, and you know broadcasting is such a we're, it's such a small industry you know right. one person says one bad thing about you everybody knows it whether it's true or not um you know i've, I've gone through those things myself i'm sure you have 
whether it's true or not, somebody says something and, and, and you're sort of stuck with that label. Um, it's fascinating to me that, that you guys wouldn't talk to each other at all that, you know, a, a well, Craig it's much, it's, or a James yeah, Corden or something like much, that. It's much different than the presidents who were serving the United States of America. Now to use the term self-serving, we were just serving ourselves, entertaining America, competing against each other. Um, I don't, I never even thought of it. It's like, uh, I mean, when I was doing the CBS show, uh, Kimmel and Conan were the competition. Um, uh, I ran into Conan in New York and he sat down and we chatted for a while. He's very nice. We just chatted. Um, and that's that. And I saw him, I ran into him another time when he was in LA and we chatted, but, uh, no, there's really, no, I, I just don't, uh, I don't relate to it. I, I, but I am a bit of a recluse or a bit of a loner or a bit of, I, an, I like to say I'm an Island. So I keep to myself and I, I really like uh, my my life that I have, and um, I don't really relate to uh, some of the other people. Hmm, that's fascinating so, uh, to me. Really? Yeah, because I would I would think, like I said, it being such a small fraternity, to find people that can relate to what you go through in those sorts of roles. I'm going to tell you I, this is a story I want to tell on my podcast. I'm telling you is I met. Jay Leno, the first time I met Jay Leno, I ended up doing his show later, but when I was doing the CBS Late Late Show, um, we, we record at CBS Television City over here at uh, Beverly and Fairfax. Mm -hmm. And, but they also record like uh, the show, what was the big show on Fox with uh, Ryan Seacrest and Simon Cowell. American Idol. American yeah. Idol. They were filming American Idol there. They tape it there. They record it. And then uh, Bill Maher's show was recording there, Politically Incorrect, that was on ABC, because we have different studios there. So Leno was on Bill Maher's show, but it's backstage, and I'm coming down to rehearse. He's in the hallway talking to somebody. He sees me and stops me to say hi. I just started the CBS Late Night Show. And um, I, I was very nice to him. And uh, I told him, do my show. You know, he goes, oh, Dave wouldn't like that. <laughs> but, cause let him, but he said to me, hey, Craig, you seem a little standoffish. And I enjoy that word. I'm, I, I mean, it, it, I know what he was saying. There's a little bit of me where I'm in my own world, and I kind of like that. I think a lot of people that go in entertainment are screwed up and neurotic. And I'm from the Midwest, and I think I'm kind of level-headed and down to earth. And then I do this shtick, this, uh, this uh, I wear ascots, and I do this silliness, and it's all an act. But uh yeah. So I, it doesn't, your question, I don't even, it's never even crossed my mind. I don't uh, know. I mean, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think the other guys do either. I don't think uh, Kimmel hangs out and talks to Conan. I don't think any of that happened. Is there any sort of daily show you would want to do at this stage of your career? Or do you just not, again, is it just, you don't, you don't really have the ambition to do that. Like if somebody said, here's a blank canvas, Craig, go. Half Not, hour, hour, whatever. No, I don't think that way right now. I'm I'm thinking more about writing a book. You know, it's it's more of uh, I'm not I'm not. We have enough shows. We have enough podcasts. Uh, I'm doing it for I I have some subscribers and fans and followers, and I'm doing it for them because they wanted me to do it. My my nieces wanted me to join Instagram, so I did. I do get a kick out of Instagram. Some the podcast is fun and it's enjoyable. Uh, and it just started and we're going to keep, it's going to be fluid. It's going to, it's, I'm going to change things. I'm going to add things, but I have no desire. No, I, I apologize, uh, Jason. It sounds like I'm disappointing you with my answer. Not at all. I, because I, I remember, no, because we talked about this last year. I reached out to you. I don't mind telling people this because a little peek behind the curtain um, with my company. And I had reached out to you. So no, I'm not disappointed. I already knew you kind of felt this way. I just didn't know if there was any sort of project. Not that I would launch it. I, I have no idea. But I'm just, I'm not disappointed at all. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated because, again, you're a creative type. And I, I love getting to, into the brain of other creative types because I'm because I'm the same way. I'm always I'm always coming up with a new idea. Ooh, I think I want to do this. And then if I still feel that way a few days later, I, I, I put a pen to paper and some days few days later comes along and I'm like, yeah, that was a stupid idea. So I'm, so to me, I was just kind of curious about if there was anything out there that, that Craig Kilborn was just like, Oh, I, I, 
I have a space I could fill. There's a niche that needs to be filled. That sort of thing. That's all. Well, it would be, it would be what I told you would be something with my character and script. Sure. My favorite sitcom was Frasier, but uh, those are, you have to realize I'm, I'm telling you, those are long shots. Kelsey Grammer still would like to do a sitcom. He's as, as successful as they get. Uh, Alec Baldwin would still like to do a sitcom. They were hooked up to do a sitcom together a few years ago. It didn't, it didn't go forward. I don't think people realize how sitcoms and scripted shows are like hitting the lottery. It's but there's really a million cool. platforms out there today. See, I would think it'd be the opposite. Yeah, there's and so there, many and there places. Are a billion shows being pitched to these million sure. platforms if you're using those numbers. Yeah, yeah. So that's the that, that's the way it is. But uh it sounds like you don't like the idea that I might write a book called Above the Fray. Why would I why would I not like that idea? Well, there's an idea. There's uh, that that you want me to you want to see my pretty face. I'm going to you're going to have to read a book. You don't have to see my pretty face. <laughs> I mean, you're acting like TV show. No, there's no TV show I want to do. You know, sorry. I don't. I, there's there's no right answer. It's not. I a, it's. Not a, it's, just, I, it's a, I. I find. I just find it interesting. That's right. all. I. I love it. I love getting into the mind, like I said, of other people that that do this sort of stuff and seeing where their head is. And and who knows? In twenty years from now, I might feel the same way, where I don't want to be on radio or TV, and I do want to go more the writing route. Just something I did earlier in my career that I might. I might feel the same way, you know, right. at that stage, at that stage of my life. I feel like I've, I've pulled the Bill Belichick with you. Why do you do? I don't know why you keep saying that. It's not true I'm just at kidding. all. I'm just... Uh, listen, this has been fun. Uh, I appreciate you doing it. Um, there's a million other people that probably want to talk to you and um, you chose to give me some time. So I'm, I am grateful. And uh, hopefully you get out to Palm Springs. I know you were talking about coming out here and, uh, we can grab coffee or something like that and do it in person. Absolutely. Nice to see you, Jason. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it, man. Be well. The Cash In with Jason Page. Weeknights at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on Sports Map Radio.